So uh, last Thursday was the fifth anniversary of uh, our founder, Reverend Sung Young Moon, and his ascension to the spiritual world. Mother Moon created an incredible event. Actually, I don't know how many of you were able to watch it, but it started at 5.30. The broadcast started a little bit before 5.30 our time and went past midnight. <laughs> so, you know, you had six hours of, of most of it is entertainment. You know, we had an incredible performance by the uh, a ballet performance near the end, and you had performance by all kinds of people. Anyway, we'll, I'll show the announcements that have more information about all the different things that happen um, uh, as, as part of the announcements for the international announcements. But there are so many important activities, especially Christian leaders, but um, Mother Moon's vision is that the, the anniversary of Father's death and the ascension to the spiritual world is not a time for mourning. It's an occasion for us to remember and recognize the accomplishments and then take action to continue to move that providence and the work of true parents forward towards building uh, God's world, God's heavenly kingdom. So today I thought I would share a little bit about Father's life, just to kind of remind us about uh, uh, all that he went through in his life, but particularly to um, share my own experiences, the top things that I feel like I gained and I, I learned from Father Moon. And then when we have time for our discussion, then my hope is that you'll look at that list and see, well, how much does that match and, and what things do I have that I can say that I have, where Father Moon has significantly impacted my life. Uh, if you want, you can check the air conditioner. Make sure, because I see a lot of people going, I know I don't think it's because I'm so inspiring. <laughs> so <clears throat> let's start with um, Father Moon's life. He was born in 1920 uh, in the small country. If you look at the globe there, there's that little bitty spot, Korea. 1920, not too many people in the world knew where Korea was or had even heard of it. Um, he was born in a, a farming town um, uh, to a farming family, very, very poor. And Korea at that time was pretty much a backward nation, very little technology. Uh, and it was under the control of Japan at that time, a, an oppressive control. So he, he was born there, and you can see on the map on the right, it's halfway between Pyongyang, the capital in the north, and uh, China. So it was way up in the north part of, of Korea. Well, <clears throat> born in that family, but then at the age of 10, his family converted to Christianity. And it's an interesting thing, that's, that's around 1930. In 1930, there was an incredible amount of persecution, particularly of Korean Christians being done by Japan, because the Christians were the big troublemakers. <laughs> you know, religious people tend to be troublemakers, right? Um, and so the J Japanese force were particularly brutal in their uh, persecution of Christians in Korea, especially. So it's an interesting time for the, the family to convert to Christianity, right? It's kind of like going the, the opposite direction. They were a lot safer if they were just Confucianists. But he converted to Christianity, and, and he became pretty fervent and very active in, um, uh, in, in the church, going to church regularly, and focused a lot on the participation. And as he got older, around the age of 14, 15, he reports in his, in his um, autobiography that um, he saw so much suffering happening in the world around him. Of course, there was the persecution from Japan, but even around him, he saw people starving, and a lot of people dying, uh, you know, early deaths, you know, un unexpected, unnatural deaths. And so he kept wondering, why is there so much suffering, especially as a Christian, when you, you know, you're taught about Jesus' love and how much God loves us, if God loves us so much, why is my life so miserable? Why is the world so full of evil? And uh, especially from, you know, as, as a Christian. So he sought desperately to pray, how can I understand this? Something's wrong. And actually at the age of 15, um, it's 16 by Korean years, but 15 by Western counting. Um, he uh, had a powerful experience with Jesus Christ. And that's when he got his, his calling. Um, and I'm just going to read a little excerpt about how, how he describes that experience in his autobiography. He says, uh, It was the night 
before Easter, the year I turned 16. I was on Mount Myodu, praying all night and begging God in tears for answers. Why had he created a world so filled with sorrow and despair? Why was the all-knowing and all-powerful God leaving the world in such pain? What should I do for my tragic homeland? I wept in tears as I asked these questions repeatedly. Early Easter morning, after I'd spent the entire night in prayer, Jesus appeared before me. He appeared in an instant like a gust of wind and said to me, God is in great sorrow because of the pain of humankind. You must take on a special mission on earth having to do with heaven's work. That day, I clearly saw the sorrowful face of Jesus. I heard his voice clearly. The experience of witnessing the manifestation of Jesus caused my body to shake violently, like a quaking aspen's leaves trembling in a strong breeze. I was simultaneously overcome with fear so great I felt I might die, and gratitude so profound I felt I might explode. Jesus spoke clearly about the work I would have to do. His words were extraordinary, having to do with saving humanity from its suffering and bringing joy to God. So from this, and, and I encourage you, if you haven't read it, uh, Peace Loving Global Citizen is Father Moon's uh, uh, autobiography. If you don't have a copy, let me know. I've got one for you. So just, just ask. But from this, there's two of the most important points stand out for me um, that I've learned from Father Moon. And the first one is this statement that God is suffering. This is quite contrary to most traditional uh, Christian or even religious thinking that God, the Almighty God, all-powerful God on high, is actually suffering. But Father Moon emphasizes to us that truly if God is a God of love, and especially through, uh, through Jesus Christ we know how deeply God loves us as a parent, loves children, how could a loving parent not suffer when seeing the children suffer. So this was the first very important point for me in terms of the significance that Father Moon has had in, in my life. And I think one of the most important teachings of our whole unificationist worldview is understanding that God is not a distant God up on high, but a God that deeply loves us and is suffering with the children when they suffer. And the second point is an understanding of human responsibility. You know, this plea, why are bad things happening? To understand that this world is not the way God designed this world to be. This is not the world of God's ideal. Sometimes there's this back and forth struggle. God's all powerful, but we're living in this messed up world. What's going on? And the key component to understand here is human responsibility. And again, one of the most important things I, I think that I, I learn, and even I think in our whole teachings, is understanding the role and the power we have in being partners with God in creating this world, in creating the situation. Let me read from the Divine Principle. This is the section uh, from the chapter on predestination. It reads, God must predestine his will and bring about its realization in the ways of goodness, not the ways of evil. God is the author of goodness. So very important. God is only good. God does not intend anything that obstructs or opposes the fulfillment of the purpose of creation. The purpose that God created us for was to experience joy through a loving relationship with God and people and all things. In particular, he could not have predestined the human fall or sins that make fallen human beings liable to judgment. This also very important theological concept. You know, are you predestined to sin? Was the fall part of God's plan? 
Absolutely not. And one important thing is unification should stand to uphold the absolute goodness of God and absolute love of God as our Heavenly Parent. According to the principle of creation, God's purpose of creation can be realized only when human beings complete their portion of responsibility. That's very key for us to understand how God's will is going to be accomplished. Although God's will to realize the purpose of the providence of restoration is absolute, God's will and goal is absolute. Won't give up. However, God predestines the process of its accomplishment, how it's going to happen, conditionally, contingent upon the responsibility of the central figure. So even though God's determined this is where we're going, the ideal world, a world where everyone experiences God's love and fulfilling families and a beautiful relationship with nature and creation, God will never give up on that. But when that gets accomplished depends. God has lots of plans, sets it up and invites us to participate. But if we don't participate, then it's delayed and delayed and delayed. And that's why we have this evil world that we have now. Such a powerful understanding for me in my life. It actually transformed my life from, oh, you know, get Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want. <laughs> God, I need a new refrigerator. <laughs> God, changing that to, God, I'm your partner. I need a new refrigerator. Help me figure it out. <laughs> Please inspire me. Please give me, you know, open, keep my eyes open for the opportunity. Partnership. It's partnership. And that understanding that God loves us desperately as a loving parent and that we have a portion of responsibility to see the fulfillment of God's will, those are the key first understandings for me that Father Moon has brought to the world. And this, these two points here transform so much of the way we look at life. So I think these, these are my top two most important things. But then Father Moon, after he received the calling from Jesus, you know, understands that God's suffering, understands that humans have responsibility, then he spent a lot of time um, researching the, the, what teachings we call the divine principle. And one of the most important understandings he came to was what is the source of evil? Where did evil first come from? What is the, the fall of humanity? And it comes down to, and I encourage you to, to take time to study the divine principle and really read through the chapter on the fall, because it goes into a lot of detail. But the bottom line is it was the misuse of the ideal of love. The original parents, Adam and Eve, came together as husband and wife without first becoming people of true love. So their love was dominated by selfishness and self-centeredness. And the problem we have, almost every problem we have in society, we can bring back to the problem of selfishness and the breakdown of the experience of God's perfect love in our life, which is God's design. And therefore, the solution to the problems of the world start with families. So the third point is this emphasis on the godly families as the key to world peace. All we, you know, Unification Movement, we're famous for these marriage blessing ceremonies. And you saw in the, the, the video, the centerpiece of the event, of the, the, the uh, annual Sungwa celebration, was this blessing of marriage uh, ceremony. Now, most of the people you saw in the video, they're getting married, you know, this initially. But also, around the world, many people were participating, and also thousands of people who were already married, participating in rededicating their marriage to God, offering it to God. And again, that's also an important tradition that Father Moon Breck the blessing of marriage and a tradition of rededicating marriages to bring God to the center to transform the world. So that's the third really important point for me is the importance of the family. And uh, you know, godly families at the center of all, number one, because the root of the problem comes from the family, the original sin and ancestral problems like that, but also the family is where we learn about love and relationships. So if God is able to dwell in the family, then we're able to experience God's love directly first through our parents and our learn about relationships with our brothers and sisters and multiply from the family to the community, to the nation, and ultimately to the world. So even though world peace is going to require some 
treaties and peace agreements and things like that. We'll never have true peace in the world until we have peace starting with the individuals and the families and the communities and expanding out to the nations in the world. So that's the third point. Now, <clears throat> Father Moon, <clears throat> and so that's why he instituted the blessing of marriage ceremony and the rededications that we do. So in, in the 1960s, Father Moon first began traveling around the world. I think 1965 was his first world tour where he traveled all the way around the world on a speaking tour. And in 1971, he came to America. Or actually, he moved. So he's 50 years old now. He comes to America and actually establishes in 1971 New York City as the world mission headquarters for the entire world. So from 1971, Father Moon and his family are pretty much stationed in, in New York, still traveling around. But during that time, there was a number of speaking tours that he did, especially first coming to America uh, with titles like Christianity in Crisis and the Day of Hope Tour, bringing hope to America. And he brought a message about, he often referred to the three great headaches of God and trying to wake up America to the calling that this nation has and the hope and vision that God has for this nation. So I want to read just an excerpt from um, a letter that was sent out to thousands of, of clergy um, speaking, where he speaks about these three great headaches of God and also the, America's role and responsibility to take them on. So um, he writes, today God has three major headaches. The first is atheistic totalitarianism, the expansion of communism. The second headache for God is moral decline, in particular the degenerate state of young people across the entire world, the downfall of the traditional family. Last, what makes God most sad is the rancor and disunity within the Christian faith. To resolve these headaches, in 1971, God called me to come to the United States and guide a movement to revive the vision of Christianity. Following him, I spread the word of God, stirred the American people in order to unite Christianity, to restore morality and destroy atheistic communism. The United States is truly a nation chosen by heaven, a nation chosen as an example of a Christian of Christian love and unity, as well as a nation chosen to sacrifice for and to serve others in a world immersed in anguish. So the three great headaches, the breakdown of the family, which we address and we're working on through the, the blessing and marriage rededications, the disunity among religious people, many conferences bringing people of different faiths together, and particularly, the common base we have is the family. And then thirdly was this issue of atheistic, materialistic worldview. Now, since the fall of the Soviet Union, and some of you probably don't even remember the Soviet Union, <laughs> but the, the fall of communism, the collapse of that world-level uh, communist um, uh, empire, we seems like communism has kind of faded in the background. But actually, the thinking... The ideology behind it is alive and well. We see it all over, particularly the, the, the uh, secular, anti-spiritual, anti-religious um, bias and, and, and perspective. That and, you know, what you do is, you know, your only value is your physical life. So Father Moon, to take these things on, you know, he, he had to address the problem of the breakdown of family, had to address the problem of religious people being in conflict, and this problem of this atheistic worldview. So these, again, the top three things, understanding that God is suffering, understanding human responsibility, understanding the importance of the family, and then Father Moon presents a God-centered worldview to counter the Marxist, communist, the secular, humanistic, materialistic worldviews that tend to dominate our life these days. We call it Godism. 
not one particular church or one particular denomination, but really put God at the center, a God-centered point of view. And for me, on an intellectual level, this is really exciting. Understanding about God's suffering heart, you know, this and God's parental love, this moves me deeply in my heart. You know, and understanding about the family, also very important. But boy, when I start thinking about the way the philosophical implications and all this is like, whoa, <laughs> kind of blows my mind, honestly. Because to have this kind of perspective that addresses all aspects of life and society, how do we bring God into every circumstance and every situation with not a superstitious belief, but with a, a true foundation of logic and scientific perspectives? Now, Father Moon in, invested a lot of energy in uh, some of these, we call it a critique of um, atheistic ideology, the critique of Marxism and communism and counterproposal. It's easy to point out what's wrong. It's hard to say what's wrong and then also offer an alternative, which is what Godism does. It gives us real hope for the future. And I look forward to the time when there's more opportunities for us to really see that ideology, that worldview spreading um, through college campuses, through the media, and through the arts. But also, this God-centered worldview takes on the issue of selfishness, which is often a root of most of our problems. You know, even the ideal, you can set up the ideal situation, but if you've still got selfish people, <laughs> even the best system in the world is going to break down because of corruption. So a clear critique and understanding about the value of, a, uh, of living for the sake of others, a benef uh, the, the joy that we can experience by making a positive difference in the environment around us, that there's much more joy to be had there than a selfish and a self-centered life. And then the application of this godism, this, this worldview, to every aspect of life. And so Father Moon, in his commitment to bringing transformation to the world, the list of projects, I think the last couple of years on the anniversary, I went through a list of like the hundreds of projects and programs and activities. It'd take me a month to go through them all, <laughs> to, to explore them all. But if you just look at the areas that Father Moon is touching on, you know, from the beginning uh, vision, you know, of course, the blessing of marriage, dealing with families, education, particularly character education, uh, world relief, uh, interfaith activities, food, dealing with nature and the natural environment, business and industry, science and technology, world peace, getting even politicians together, like the, the um, uh, Universal Peace Federation, uh, the world media, m media conferences, um, healing work, medicine, sports and arts, and of course the family at the center of it all. So Father Moon invested in all these areas and touched on all these areas just to get the spark lit. And it's for us to carry that banner forward. This is the part of the legacy that we inherit that comes to us from Father Moon's work. So then, finally, we've got the understanding about God's suffering heart, understanding about human responsibility, understanding about the family, and having a world view that addresses the problems and the challenges of society today, then in, when Father was around 60 or 70 years old, Father proclaims home church and tribal messiahship. So he first started talking about home church in 1978. And then in 1988, he started this hometown providence and said, sent us all out. He, you know, all these big church centers where all the missionaries were living together said, go back to your hometown. I now proclaim you tribal messiahs. You're to be messiahs to your tribe, to your community, to your people. And in 1995, he actually ended the Unification Church and said, we're no longer a Unification Church. We are now the Family Federation for World Peace and Unification. So move the emphasis away from the centralized organization and put the emphasis on the family. The family is the key to building the kingdom of heaven. So, we are tribal messiahs. 
This is what he called us to be. We all have an original mind that yearns for beauty, truth, and happiness. We want to be good people, able to raise beautiful families where all relationships of true love can blossom. Strong families are the building block of a healthy community, where each person can work together to create a peaceful and prosperous world. We are the Family Federation. Join us for world peace and unification. Nice little spot, don't you think? <laughs> Makes it paints a, a, a beautiful, a beautiful picture. I like this uh, logo that uh, um, uh, they developed a vision of what the ideal world is going to look like, so with the family at the center and multiplying to other families and the communities and the society and the world. So, finally, the the these these are the five points for me. That, that most strongly uh, affected my life in, in, uh, in when I think and I reflect upon the work of, of Father Moon. So let me uh, just close with this last quote from Father Moon about tribal messiahs. He says, The time for me to lead the Unification Church has passed. Now is the time for horizontal expansion. Hence, when each of you expands the family ideal to encompass your tribe, the world will naturally be restored by that much. The way to expand to the tribe is home church. So the emphasis on our responsibility to be good partners who can comfort God's heart, who can accomplish God's will. True Father left this legacy to us. <clears throat> It's up to us to build what Mother Moon calls a culture of heart, starting with our own family in our community. But it means we need to take action. Unlike the traditional religious beliefs that, oh, God is going to fix it all. God is going to come down and magically transform the world. We're the ones God is counting on. Now, God magically transforms our lives when we get involved with God. And when we participate in partnership with God, miracles happen. Actually, magic does happen. But it requires our participation, our active effort and energy. So in talking about tribal messiahship, how do we fulfill that? Where do we take action? We start, of course, within our own home. But then the people in our lives. We want to always be making a difference. And the people, the friends we have, the people we care about. You know, I encourage you, come up with your list of the things that are most important to you when you think about what profound difference has Father Moon made in my life? What things are so important to me that really I want to be able to share this with the people I love, the people I care about. For me, it's understanding God's suffering heart, understanding the power of human beings, not just a burden of responsibility, but the amazing thing that God has called us to be partners with God, that we can participate in transforming the world, the importance of the families, this whole worldview that brings God to the center of everything that we do in our lives, and the empowerment that God has given us that we can live lives as tribal messiahs and bring God's healing and work to the world. So please uh, join me as I offer a prayer. Good morning, Father, Mother, God, our loving Heavenly Parent. We are so grateful for your presence in our lives, and especially at this anniversary of the, the death and ascension of uh, uh, True Father, Heavenly Parent. We, we want to reflect on the incredible impact that he's had in our lives, and especially the legacy that left behind us, now being carried father, forward by Mother Moon, to Bring your healing, your love, and your truth to this world. Heavenly Parent, I pray you can work in our hearts and minds and guide us, particularly as we, we struggle to fulfill the incredible potential that you've given us to be tribal messiahs, to be people who can multiply the blessing to the people that we care about, the people in the world around us. Heavenly Parent, give us the strength, give us the vision, give us the love and the power 
to go beyond our concepts, our fears, all the hesitations, all the excuses that we have not to reach out, not to make a difference in the world around us. Thank you so much for the trust that you have, for the life that we've able to inherit from our true parents and the opportunity to participate in comforting your heart and bringing healing to this world. So, Heavenly Parent, please receive our prayer, our hearts, and our minds as your sons and daughters. And we offer up this together. Amen and adieu. Okay, so please turn to your neighbor and share about the top things for you. Now, the difference the Father's made.